Good morning, Kent Cove. It's good to be with you this morning. Our text this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, which read like this. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. Well, we are in our second week of talking about practices, the practices, and we're going to be looking over the next several weeks at different spiritual practices that help us tune in and pay attention to our spiritual life. It struck me as I was thinking about this uh, that we as people, regardless of what we do, whether um, no matter what discipline that perhaps we practice, what art or sport or field of study or profession that we uh, kind of exist in or do, whether for work or for fun, whatever it might be, that every one of these things uh, requires us to first learn the fundamentals, right? If you play a sport, the first thing you have to do in that sport is learn the fundamental skills of that sport. If you are a musician, the first thing you have to do is learn the fundamentals of music. And so you practice scales, which are boring and excruciating. But the more you practice them and master them, the more it shows up later as you explore that art. As I was thinking about this, it strikes me that when an art form or uh, there whether it's in an art form or in a profession or whatever, when there's some new development or someone breaks into completely new territory, that this almost always is done by a person who learned the fundamentals. When you think about music, and I'm a big jazz fan, right? I love jazz music, but when you study the great jazz musicians, you learn that the first thing they did was learn the scales and theory and all of these things because you can't do great jazz music unless you understand music in general. When you watch a great athlete uh, and you see them perform in a way that is, you know, above and beyond those who are on the field or court with them, you recognize someone who spent hours and hours learning the fundamentals of that sport. If you are into, you know, computers or whatever, and there's somebody that just uh, breaks into new territory in coding or, you know, whatever it might be, this is someone who understands in a fundamental way what it takes to make that work, right? That's how things work. I, I was reminded of one of my favorite American authors, Norman McLean, who wrote uh, primarily short stories taught at the University of Chicago. You may have heard of, a, of a, one of his short stories called A River Runs Through It. And in the movie adaptation of this short story, uh, the narrator, who is Norman himself, wrote the, or said this, Norman was a preacher's kid, and he said, as a Presbyterian, my father believed that man by nature was a damn mess, and that only by picking up God's rhythms were we able to regain power and beauty. To him, all good things, trout as well as eternal salvation, come by grace, and grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. I love that image because I think it says something to us about our spiritual lives. You see, the reality is that as we practice our faith, that we have to learn fundamentals, and we have to learn 
uh, kind of the simple steps that help us to move in faith. And as I thought about it, I feel like this, these verses that we read this morning provided some of the rhythms that Norman McLean was talking about, God's rhythms of joy, prayer, and gratitude. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now there are three hard things about this text. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, right? I mean, there, I don't think it's a mistake that Paul says these things. He doesn't say these things because, oh, well, that's easy for us to do. No, he reminds us precisely because these are fundamentals that we have to practice over and over until we get that rhythm in our life and we begin to experience God's presence through them. So I want to look for just a few minutes at each of these and then talk about some ways that we can maybe incorporate them in our lives. Rejoice always. Well, how does one do that? As Peter mentioned, life is hard, right? I mean, we go through seasons in life where to think about rejoicing always, um, you know, quite frankly, there are seasons when that can leave a bitter taste in your mouth, right? Because life is just crushing you, and it's so hard. So how can we do that? Well, I think a couple of things about that. The first is that it's important for us context-wise to recognize who it was that Paul wrote these words to. Who was Paul telling to rejoice always? Well, he was writing to the church in Thessalonica. And if you go all the way back to the beginning of this letter, well, not all the way back, it's only five chapters, right? But when you go back to chapter one, right at the beginning of, of this letter, Paul says this to his brothers and sisters at Thessalonica. He says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So who was Paul writing to? Paul was writing to a church that had suffered great persecution. And they were in the midst of really difficult times when Paul came to them and preached the gospel to them, and they received the gospel with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. You see, the root word of this command to rejoice always is the word that in English means gift. And what is the most, I think, one of the most basic elements or rhythms of understanding the spiritual life it is understanding that all is gift. Everything that we have, everything that we are, comes from God. Even the very breath in our lungs belongs to God. It was given to us as a gift. And so then, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we can work, and I understand it requires work sometimes, to recognize and rejoice and give thanks for that gift, for the gift of life itself. Rejoice always. This gift of joy. A couple of things to understand. Joy is not conditional. Joy is not happy feelings. Joy is the deep-seated hope that comes from experiencing and trusting the goodness of God. It's not happy, clappy, oh, everything's going to be all right, precious moments kind of faith. This is the kind of faith that takes root in the dark times. This is the kind of faith that takes root in the midst of brokenness and pain and betrayal and all of the things that life throws our way. We have joy because we recognize that even in the midst of that, God is good. Now, part of understanding that 
we'll come back to in a few minutes. But the reality is that the beginning of the spiritual life, the beginning of the ability to practice that rhythm of rejoicing always is recognizing that everything is gift. The very breath in our lungs, the fact that Jesus loves us and has redeemed us and walks with us, all of those things are things that we can rejoice for. The next difficult challenge is to pray continually. Now, oftentimes I think we read this and we think, well, how do I pray continually? I have to live my life. I have to do all the things, right? I've got to go to work. I've got to make breakfast. I have to clean. I've got to do, you know, whatever it is, it can be, it can seem difficult. But the word that's used here for continually is a word that means to stay or remain or continuing, continue in. It also can be ongoing or on a regular schedule. Now, here's a little secret for us in the kind of in the evangelical world, right? We tend to have a bias against what we would call, usually with a little bit of tone, rote prayers, right? R-O-T-E, prayers of memory, right? Like the one maybe we just prayed that our Lord taught us, right? We have a way of looking at those as somehow they're less spiritual. But the gift that those things give to us and the gift of the, of the early church is to look at There's a reason why they set up a schedule to pray in the morning and at noon and at dinner and at going to bed. All of these different things, right? Because as we pray those prayers and we practice that schedule, we are praying continually. The other piece of praying continually I think that that we need to recognize is that this is not something that has to happen where we, you know, fold our hands, bow our heads, and close our eyes. One of the great spiritual classics of uh, the church is a book by a monk named Brother Lawrence called Practicing the Presence of God. And his, the whole premise of his, uh, of this little book is that you can practice the presence of God wherever you are, no matter what you're doing, recognizing, giving thanks, rejoicing, being grateful as you wash the pots for all the other monks, as you wash the dishes from family dinner, as you clean the bathrooms, as you work, as you do all these things, you can be aware and give thanks to God that, you know, well, maybe when you're at work, it's to give thanks for God that He is giving you provision through this job, right? Or whatever it might be, that you can pray continually by just training yourself to be aware of God's presence even in the midst of Actually, especially in the midst of the mundane, right? Because let's be honest, as much as we like to talk about living glorious lives that are just, you know, so filled with passion and all those kinds of things, the reality is is that a whole lot of life is mundane. A whole lot of life is being stuck in traffic, you know, doing the dishes, uh, you know, helping the kids with homework, whatever, paying the bills, whatever it is, Right? I mean, we spend a lot of time doing mundane tasks. But if we can learn to pray continually, if we can be aware uh, and give thanks to God as we do these tasks, then all of a sudden we start to get into that rhythm that we talked about. Then the final challenge in in these three verses, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Friends, this is a difficult one. And for years and years and years, I struggled with this verse. Because how is it that we can give thanks in all circumstances? Well, part of the problem was when I was younger and I heard this verse, I heard it to mean give thanks for all circumstances, which is the wrong preposition altogether. Right? Because that's a huge difference. But here's the reality. A lot of times we in the church talk about this verse as if we are saying give thanks for all circumstances. That is not what Paul said. Paul said give thanks in all circumstances. Right? So we do not worship a God who tortures his children sending calamities to us to test our faith or to punish us. 
We live in the now and the not yet. We live in that time in between when Jesus has come, but his kingdom has not come in fullness. We rejoice because we have been redeemed, restored, and loved by Jesus. But brothers and sisters, not every trial or challenge that comes your way is from the hand of God. Right? This is just pure truth. Not everything that happens to you in your life comes from the hand of God. Many of those things are the result of our own sin and brokenness. Bad choices that we make. Some are the, are the result of the sin and brokenness of other people. Or, or others yet are just a result of the brokenness of a creation that's groaning for the redemption of God. And too often in the church, we talk about this verse like we should, some kind of uh, stoic philosophy where we should just bear up and give thanks for everything that happens to us. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is that we are to intentionally give thanks in the midst of those things. I do not give thanks for depression, that black dog that haunts the corners of my life. But I intentionally seek to be grateful even and especially when that dog is on the prowl. I do not give thanks for the times in my life where I've been uncertain about where God is taking me and what's happening in, the, you know, in my ministry and all of those things, but I seek to be grateful in the midst of that circumstance. Because I recognize that none of those things are necessarily from the hand of God, but God is with me in those circumstances. And so then I can give thanks in the midst of them. Friends, what I'm trying to get at here, what I'm trying to say, is that gratitude is fundamental to the spiritual life. Gratitude is fundamental to the spiritual life. If we are going to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, the very first step that we have to do to learn that is to learn gratitude to recognize those places where God shows up. Now, I want to suggest this morning that there are two ways, just, these are just two simple ways to be grateful. This isn't the summation of all gratitude practices, but these are two that I find helpful. The first is to try to remember that God is for us. Now, notice how I said that. Try to remember that God is for us. I do not speak to you as one who's never walked through the desert where I wonder where God is and why he's not showing up in my life. I know what it's like to be in that place. I know what it's like to live life in the midst of uncertainty and not knowing what's going to happen next. What, what is, how, how are we going to make it? Right? So I recognize that there are days when all you can do is try to remember that God is for us. Because there are certainly days when I've wondered where in the world He is. And that's okay. Because guess what? God is big enough to handle it. Right? So we can be recognized that the best we can do sometimes is to simply try. Listen to these words from Dorothy Sayers. She said this, For whatever reason God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death, he had the honesty and courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game he is playing with his creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole human experience from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. 
In other words, God is with us. You see, friends, that's good news for us. The only way that we can rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances is to recognize that God is with us every step of the way, even and especially when we don't feel like He's there at all. God is after our redemption and transformation. He walks with us in the midst of it all. He doesn't leave us on our own, but He walks with us, He comforts us, He knows our sorrow. I came across these words of a young cancer warrior that give, uh, give words to this presence in the midst of these difficult circumstances that we might face. She wrote, I see mercy in the dusty sunlight that outlines the trees, in my mother's crooked hands, in the blanket my friend left for me, in the harmony of the wind chimes. It is not the mercy I asked for, but it is mercy nonetheless. And I learn a new prayer. Thank you. It's a prayer I don't mean yet, but I will repeat it until I do. Call me cursed, call me lost, call me scorned, but that's not all. Call me chosen, blessed, sought after. Call me the one who God whispers his secrets to. I am the one whose belly is filled with loaves of mercy that were hidden from me. Even on days when I'm not so sick, sometimes I go lay on the mat in the afternoon light to listen for him. I know it sounds crazy and I can't really explain it. But God is in there, even now. I have heard it said that some people can't see God because they won't look low enough. And it's true. Look lower. God is on the bathroom floor. Friends, God walks with us. He does not leave us. The name Emmanuel is not just a neat theological proclamation in the scriptures. It is a statement of Jesus' identity. God with us. In the midst of our trials, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our pain, God is with us so that we can learn to rejoice always. Pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances. So the first step, the first practice, is to remember that fact and to hold on to it, even and especially when it seems impossible. Secondly, I think if we're to do these three things and to practice gratitude, it takes intentionality. Intentionality takes work. Some of you maybe know that for a, there was a season a couple years ago, actually not that long ago, that I was out of ministry. I didn't have a call. And I was working in uh, a winery. And, uh, and things were a little rough. I mean, it, it was a fun job, but uh, let's just say it left something to be desired as far as income goes. Um, and had a hard time was really feeling and wondering where God was and what was going on and all of these things. And my brother and I started this practice, this gratitude practice. Actually, my brother kind of forced me into it. But we would begin texting each other. And we would text each other every day. And the beginning of the text would be T-I-A-G colon. Today I am grateful. And then we would list at least one thing that we were grateful for. Some days, it was just whatever, I, you know, I mean, I had to grasp at straws because I just wasn't feeling it, right? So you just find one thing. Other days, it was a list. And as that practice went on, you know, it helped move me from this place of um, feeling lost and just really difficult. And so there was one month where I'd had a really good month at the winery, right? 
and things were going well. It felt like, felt like we had turned a corner and all this stuff. So I was on my way to work on a, on a Sunday morning. I stopped at Starbucks to get a coffee, pop on the freeway. I'm heading for work. I'm happy. I'm like looking around going, this is, life is good. This is good. Everything's great. I look down at my speedometer. Oops, look up. Oops, there's the cop. Right? Sure enough, here he comes, lights it up, pulls me over, and there went my good month. Right? But the amazing thing was, and I, I'm Scandinavian all the way to my core, so I go dark easy, right? But the amazing thing was, is I think because I had been doing that practice of gratitude, I was able to, to just be like, well, you know, this, this happens, and we'll see, we'll see what happens next. And to just learn to give thanks in all circumstances, right? Now, I recognize, friends, that some of you may find yourselves in a place where the idea of rejoicing always and giving thanks is, sounds like, you know, a pretty tall order right now. But even if you can just find the space to begin with maybe saying, I am grateful that I have breath in my lungs. Or, you know, whatever it is. Maybe it's just, you know, something even more simple than that. Start there. Give thanks there. And allow it to grow. And continue to hold on and to practice those rhythms. And as time goes on, you experience God's presence anew. And you begin to, to break into, that, into God's rhythm. Rejoice. Pray. Give thanks. Rejoice. Pray. Give thanks. And eventually, that joy begins to heal those deep places. And you begin to feel God's presence again. And one day, you will feel that that command is something that isn't an onerous or difficult challenge, but it's just part of who you are as a follower of Jesus. It's not easy. It's not trite. It's hard work. And some days, it's going to feel like it's not happening at all. But it's in those deep, dark places that the Spirit is at work in us groaning on our behalf, moving us towards God. So my prayer for you, friends, is that you would be able to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen.